Thanks, uh, thanks everyone for attending this first seminar of the season of the Foundations of Data Science uh, Virtual Seminar. Um, today we are very lucky to have Kostis Daskalakis tell us about equilibrium computation and the foundations of deep learning. So Kostis is a professor at MIT and uh, has done a lot of great work at the intersection and union of uh, theory of computation, game theory, uh, machine learning and statistics is the reception of many awards, uh, including the Nevan Lina Prize and the ACM Doctoral uh, Dissertation Award, uh, among others. Um, and uh, so we're very lucky to have him uh, here today tell us about his recent line of work uh, involving the theory of deep learning and connections to uh, complexity, the complexity theory and the theory of computation. Uh, so I'm not going to go into much more detail, and I'll leave the floor to you, Kostis. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Clement, for the kind introduction. I uh, thank all the organizers for the kind invitation to uh, present uh, in this seminar, and thank uh, all of you for uh, making the time to, to be here. Uh, I'll talk about joint work with uh, Manoli Zambetakis, who, who did his PhD uh, with me at MIT and is now a postdoc at Berkeley and Stratis Koulakis, who uh, uh, was, was visiting us uh, while fin finishing his PhD at NTUA and is currently a postdoc at SUTD. <coughs> I'm sorry. And um, the main, uh, so the topic of this talk is the interaction of um, equilibrium computation uh, and the foundation, uh, foundations of deep learning as we are moving to the multi-agent uh, world. So um, a motivating uh, uh, question for this uh, uh, talk uh, is uh, the uh, perplex uh, situation wherein um, uh, computer algorithms can beat humans in very complex games like poker and go. Uh, nevertheless, they have hard time playing other more uh, common games, such as uh, the one that the card on the right is trying to solve. This is a Waymo car trying to enter a highway, but it's being antagonized by human drivers. Uh, so much so that it has to abandon the, to abandon the attempt, uh, exit the highway and uh, try again. So my question is, uh, how is it possible that you know complex games like poker and go that a uh, few of us can play well, uh, computer algorithms can play super well, but other games that many of us can uh, sort of uh, reasonably well play, like entering highways, are hard for algorithms. Um, so that's the type of question that motivates this talk, and. Uh, let me wind back, uh, rewind a little bit and go back to the foundations of uh, deep learning in order to put a framework around my question. And uh, recall that a lot of the progress that has been made in deep learning over the past uh, 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 decade or so uh, owes to our ability to optimize really complex models. Um, as well as, of course, our access to really good hardware, access to lots of data, and sophistication around how to construct uh, our, our, our complex models and what types of objectives to uh, ask, them, ask them to optimize. But the point is that uh, uh, this wouldn't have been possible, this um, amazing progress, if uh, uh, we did not have the ability to uh, train uh, very large and complex models using simple algorithms like gradient descent. So the empirical finding is that uh, um, in uh, such uh, deep learning settings, uh, gradient descent uh, 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 discovers local minima that uh, generalize uh, quite well for the learning application in hand. So the resulting uh, uh, optimization landscape may not be convex, uh, but still gradient descent arrives at a stable point, a local minimum, and that local minima empirically 
uh, work well uh, in terms of the learning applications, several learning applications that uh, we have tried this paradigm on. Now, connecting to the previous uh, uh, slide, uh, what I see as the future of deep learning and um, even the present uh, of deep learning is that uh, uh, down the line, we're not going to be thinking about a single learning agent who is collecting data and acting in some environment, potentially changing the state of the environment. But we're going to be thinking about multiple agents who are all collect collecting data in the same environment and making actions in the same environment and thus influencing the state of the environment shared by everybody, as well as the rewards of the other agents. So, uh, and the motivating question is, what optimization machinery uh, should you endow your agents with in that multi-agent uh, world? Should you still endow them with gradient descent or some variant of gradient descent? And uh, the question is unclear there. And the reason is that practical experience with uh, gradient descent reveals that if you run gradient descent uh, for one learning agent against gradient descent that another learning agent is running or potentially many other gradient descents that a lot of other agents are running, you get instability. So, um, um, so uh, gradient descent versus gradient descent has a hard time converging, let alone to something meaningful. Now, I know that uh, Clement likes puns, so, you know, here's my question motivating the top talk. How deep is that issue with gradient descent versus gradient descent? Okay. So this is the main, uh, the motivating question for this talk. But, but before sort of like uh, uh, diving into the details, let me give one uh, baby example of gradient descent versus gradient descent failing. And that baby example is going to be motivated by what is taking place in generative adversarial networks. As you may know, generative adversarial networks, uh, their goal is to uh, uh, come up with a generator that is generating samples from a complex distribution. And the optimization formulation of uh, training that generator becomes a min-max optimization problem that is uh, 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 solved using a gradient descent against gradient ascent. So you have the minimizing player, which is the generator, run gradient descent dynamics against the uh, uh, maximizing player, which is the discriminator in that context, who is running gradient ascent at the same time. Now people may run uh, gradient descent versus gradient ascent or some variant of gradient descent versus gradient ascent. They may use the same learning rates or you know, different learning rates, People add lots of bells and whistles to uh, gradient descent ascent dynamics. And the reason they have to do that is that they tend to be super unstable. And I wanna give our converse to garbage solutions. And I wanna give two examples of this happening. So in my first example, I'm showing you the training, what happens with the train dynamics of gradient descent ascent of a standard GAN trained on the MNIST data set. So the target distribution is shown here. And what you see on these panels is the distribution that the generator generates if you stop the training at different steps. Uh, as you see the generator, if you stop at, at 10K steps, generates some uh, garbage symbols, then at 20K steps, you know, moves to generating some other garbage symbols and eventually settles in a distribution over some third uh, you know, garbage uh, uh, distribution. Uh, so here's an example where you convert, but you convert to something that you didn't like. Uh, at the bottom uh, example, I'm showing you, uh, I'm training a standard gun on a mixture of Gaussians. And, and uh, what you see here is that uh, stopping the training at different steps, uh, you, you, you get to see the generator generating samples from uh, a different modes of the mixture of Gaussians. Okay, so that's an example where sort of like the generator, the discriminator is chasing the generator. So the generator is, you know, moving around the cycle or something like that. Uh, but uh, 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 
you don't need to consider very complex uh, min-max problems like those arising in GANs to see the instability of gradient descent ascent. That instability already arises in very trivial examples. And the most trivial example where this instability arises is when your uh, objective function is the simplest function in the world. It's x scalar times y scalar. So if you have min max of x times y, the unique uh, solution is the zero, zero point. The reason being that if, that if either x or y are not zero, the opposing player can infinitely punish whoever is not using zero. So the only stable solution for this function is the zero, zero solution shown here. Uh, with an orange point. And what this trajectory is, uh, is what happens with the gradient descent ascent dynamics in this example. So if you start them here, you get this spiraling out behavior around going around the min max uh, point, right? So instability like oscillations arise already in this trivial example let alone more complex examples arising in guns, and you know, let alone multi-agent uh, complex uh, settings. So to summarize what we've seen so far, we get training oscillations and or garbage solutions, even in two agent zero sum settings, even when the function is convex concave like the X times Y function, even when it's low dimensional like the X times Y function, even when the function, the objective function is perfectly known to the optimizer. So the problem becomes much harder when the function uh, is non-convex, non-concave, it's high dimensional and it's not known at training. So you, you, you're trying to both train and learn the function, right? And what I wanna do is I wanna understand what the heck is going on here. like. Uh, 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 you know, uh, de delineate what we can hope for and what we cannot hope for in view of these issues that gradient descent ascent exhibits. And uh, to do so, I'm gonna uh, uh, basically I'm gonna follow a structure that is gonna be comparing a problem that we know and love and has been working for us in the deep learning setting, which is minimizing complex functions. And I want to compare that problem to the min, a min max problem over complex functions. Okay, so I want to understand from a computational standpoint and sort of like a, a, a training trajectory standpoint, what is the difference between these two problems? Again, the minimization problem has been, as I said, has been driving deep learning progress in past years. And what I want to understand is, you know, like how does that compare to the minimax problem, which is, you know, the first step away uh, from uh, into the multi-agent uh, world, okay? So uh, for uh, the talk, F is gonna be a Lipschitz and smooth function and the constraint set that I'm optimizing over is gonna be uh, convex and compact. And um, <clears throat> I wanna, I'm gonna consider two variants of this comparison. The first variant is gonna be sort of like, uh, in sort of like the innocent setting. So the innocent setting is when on the left, the function is convex, it's a nice ball. On the right, the function is convex concave, so a nice saddle, all right? So these settings are the settings that have been central for mathematical programming in the 20th century. And we know a lot about uh, these problems as well as the behavior or various optimization methods on these problems. Uh, and uh, sort of like uh, relevant to deep learning are these two folklore results that I'm showing you here, which uh, say that uh, in these settings, first order methods can find approximate global solutions uh, in a number of steps and queries to the function and its gradient that are polynomial in the relevant parameters. So the approximation you're, you're trying to achieve, the smoothness and the diameter of your set. 
And to be more precise about what uh, these first order methods, what types of points these first order methods arrive at in each of these two cases, and let me just be precise. So it's what you would expect. So in the minimization side, on the minimization side, these methods arrive at a point X star such that no other point decreases the function by more than epsilon. So they arrive at approximate global minima of the function. On the right, they arrive at what you would expect is the generalization of a global minima. So approximate global min max points. So these are points X star, Y star, so that no other, no deviation of X star to some X can decrease the function by more than epsilon. No deviation of uh, Y star to some Y can increase the function by more than epsilon. These are approximate global min max points. So the punchline though is that first order methods, no difference between these two settings in the, in the, in the, in the, in the convex and convex concave settings, which are the nice settings of this problem, right? And you know, if you recall my slide with X times Y, which is in particular a convex concave function, you may think, okay, now given your nice theorem here, how do you consolidate this nice theorem with the behavior of gradient descent ascent L, which was spiraling out of the equilibrium? Uh, the way you would like to consolidate that is to say that, look, if you get training oscillations with gradient descent ascent, these training oscillations are not due to some inherent intractability of the problem. They are due to not using the right training method. And as I'm gonna discuss in a few slides, there are ways to add bells and whistles to gradient descent ascent to make it convert to the min-max equilibrium in this benign setting of the min-max problem. But training oscillations are not due to some inherent intractability in this scenario. Uh, was this? Yeah. I, I have a question about those just uh, before yeah. we go to mm -hmm. more complex thing. Uh, yeah, when you say queries to F or the gradient of X, are there exact queries or is it tolerant to some like approximation slash noise when you do the queries? Uh, yeah, you can get you can get some you can get tolerant versions of this. So it's not uh, yeah, you don't need to exact uh, access. So you can get some tolerance. Okay, so the oscillations are not just because the system is very, very brittle to those things either. No, even with ex like the oscillations that I showed for X times Y are uh, happen even with exact access to your points. They're not due to, yeah, to like okay. small chaotic, like, you know, small perturbations doing weird things. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so now moving on to the more complex world, which is the modern era we're dropping the convexity from the left, we're dropping the convex concavity from the right. And all we assume is ellipsisness of the function. Now, uh, uh, well, you know, wearing my TCS hat for a second, uh, you know, the immediate complaint is like, look, you know, if your function on the left is not convex and on the right is not convex concave, good luck, okay? So, you know, you, you know it's NP hard to find, uh, you know, uh, uh, approximate. Uh, uh, global solutions, right? But now removing that uh, hat and, and being more accommodating to the deep learning uh, uh, literature, uh, well, you know, we have experience at least with problems like the one on the left that uh, global opima is not, uh, you know, are not uh, uh, necessary. You know, maybe you can get some reasonable behavior of your learning system if you arrive at local optima. So let me compromise for local, so locally optimal solutions on the left and the right and try to compare these two problems. So what do we know in that setting? Uh, and, and first to be precise about the types of local solutions I'm, I'm considering, I'm gonna be considering uh, a natural thing, epsilon delta local minima. Epsilon delta local minima are X stars so that you cannot deviate locally around, you know, uh, within a ball of radius delta around X star to decrease the function by more than epsilon. And similarly for the right. So point X star Y star is epsilon delta local min max. If you cannot, you know, locally change X star to decrease the function by more than epsilon, you cannot locally change Y star 
within a bulb to increase the function of the nephilim. So if I compromise for those solutions, what happens with our first order methods? Well, nothing much happens on the left as long as your delta is small enough. So if your delta is small enough in comparison to the approximation you're trying to achieve and the smoothness of the function, first order methods can still get you to such approximate local solutions in a number of steps that's polynomial in the relevant parameters of the problem. If you're too greedy about your delta, the problem will become a bit hard, right? Because as delta grows, the problem becomes a global problem. So eventually you will hit the NP hardness barriers. But if you, if you are, you know, uh, 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 you know, if you're not too optimistic, too, too, too aggressive with your delta and you're looking for, a lo you, know, you know, reasonably small locality as a function of epsilon and, 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 and L, uh, you can get uh, to, you know, th those local epsilon delta local minima, uh, no problem. And I claim this is the regime where deep learning operates, okay, for non-convex functions. How about on the right? On the right, you can argue that in the same regime uh, for delta, you have existence. So, uh, you know, I mean, so, uh, you know, at least for min-max problems, it's not a priori clear that you would have existence, uh, but, but, you know, you can show that you have existence for delta small enough. But the complexity is not well understood in this case. Um, and I'm going to answer the complexity of this problem in this talk. But my point is that here, training oscillations could very well be a uh, instantiation of an underlying computational interactability. Okay, and what I want to answer is, are they in this talk? And I'm going to provide an answer to that. All right. So this is the framework for this talk. And I'm about to dive in and discuss what I know for the innocent setting where your function is convex on cave, where you have terrain oscillations, but maybe you can do something to remove them. And the modern regime where the function is not is non-convex, non-concave, where even the tractability of the problem is unclear, let alone uh, getting solutions that converge to, to a local min-max solution. All right. So this is sort of like the prelude to the talk. And maybe at least uh, it's a good maybe stopping point to get some questions if there are more questions out there. Okay, so it, it seems that uh, everything is good. So let me dive into the into the convex concave setting, which uh, my 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 uh, discussion is going to be brief because my main focus is the non-convex concave case. So let's dive into this one. Recall that figure. Okay, so function x times y, you run gradient descent ascent, you get the spiraling out behavior. So what's up with that? Okay. So what is, what is up with you know, this spiraling out behavior around the uh, min-max point? So here's what I'm gonna claim. Gradient descent ascent is an example of a no regret learning procedure. Gradient descent is a no regret learning procedure. So gradient descent ascent is an example where you're running a no regret learning procedure against the no regret learning procedure in a zero sum game. And we know that no regret versus no regret is going to converge to the equilibrium of the game. However, it's only going to converge in this average sense. The average of the trajectory of no regret versus no regret converges to the min-max equilibrium of the game. And indeed, if you look at this picture, if I average this whole trajectory, I do converge to the min-max equilibrium of this game all right so no issue like this figure here presents no contradiction to what we know from no regret learning theory okay except that training oscillations are a result of the fact that convergence in in, in, in of no regret learning is only in the average sense 
Uh, and that type of convergence is the same as the convergence of the moon to the earth. So the moon is going around the earth. So the average trajectory of the moon is the earth. Okay, so no regret versus no regret has the same type of convergence to min max equilibria as the moon has to the earth. All right, except what I want, okay, is to get the moon to, to, to crash into the earth. That, that's my goal. So the question is, is there a way to make the moon crash into the earth? All right, so now let's, you know, put our physics hats uh, and look at this uh, picture there. And, yeah. Sorry, just before we make the moon crash into the earth, uh, the, the, there is a question about whether uh, in the convex concave setting that reduces to Frond and Shapir. Uh, oh, yeah, so, yeah, so Freund, I mean, from the no regret guarantees of Freund and Shapira and, you know, all other no regret guarantees, you can derive uh, this type of convergence in zero sum games. It's a, a few line argument. Whoops. A few line argument shows that uh, uh, the no regret guarantees for the two players of a zero sum game imply average, average case convergence to the min max equilibrium. That's right. Thank you. All right. So, wanted to now make the moon crash to the earth. Let's think about our celestial, you know, physics, uh, you know, and dynamics. So, you know, you have, a, you have a planet that is going around another planet. And in fact, our, our planet here is actually spiraling away from the, you know, from, from the center planet. So what does that mean, right, so intuitively? That means that the momentum of the dynamics that your planet is following are the opposite of what you want, right? So you want your planet to go towards the earth, but instead it goes to, towards outer space. So the momentum is wrong. And ideally you would have liked to correct that momentum. Okay, so that, that's the intuition. So a few years ago, we uh, uh, proposed correcting the bad momentum of the dynamics by using a classical method in optimization due to Popov and called optimistic gradient descent, which <clears throat> in every step of the gradient descent ascent dynamics, it undoes a little bit of yesterday's gradient. Okay, so my push, the gradient descent player, the push they see today is minus today's gradient with respect to X, plus with half the learning rate, yesterday's gradient with respect to X, and the uh, reverse for the ascent player. So the effect of that, if you look at my picture here, is that sort of like, if this is the push I would do with normal gradient descent ascent, now I'm gonna add half of yesterday's gradient minus to my current push, right? Effectively correcting the momentum and converging to the planet Earth, right? So uh, this is what we propose to do uh, uh, in games in the context of GANs using this classical method of Popov. And, you know, Yanis uh, Mitilagas, uh, well, you know, I, you know, I was, I was, you know, I was posting, you know, like a, a month ago or so, I was posting um, uh, a, a paper with Noah Golovich, another student of mine, uh, on a sort of like follow-up to this research, and you know, he he, he jokingly wrote uh, this on, on, on Twitter. But uh, on a, on a, on a, on, a, on a more serious note, uh, as I was saying earlier, there are classical methods in optimization for correcting the momentum of the gradient descent ascent dynamic. The one that we proposed using was, is due to Popov. There is another related uh, optimization method called the extra gradient method due to Korpelevitz. Uh, and uh, uh, what was known in that literature is that these methods asymptotically, as T goes to infinity, exhibit this last iterate convergence to the min-max equilibrium in the convex concave setting or <clears throat> in settings that are not too far from the convex concave setting. So sort of like uh, uh, a line of work uh, over the past uh, couple of years, uh, including the paper that I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, try to understand the rates at which this convergence, this last iterate convergence happens. And we have a very good understanding 
of the rates in the unconstrained case, uh, but we have a very poor understanding of the convergence rates in the constrained case. There are bounds, but they're not uh, competitive to the average case convergence bounds. And if you're looking for a very concrete open problem in this uh, uh, literature, uh, that would be one. So establish you know, fast competitive to average case convergence, last iterate convergence rates for any of these or other methods. Okay. Um, there's another question by yeah. Tong Keng Lee on whether the choice of the, F, the one half factor uh, is optimal uh, if there's a motivation for choosing, if so, if there's a motivation for choosing one half. Uh, so one half has a very, uh, there is a very natural place uh, where one half is coming from. So relating to optimistic uh, for the regular as leader literature. Um, in a sense, it is optimal. So, uh, I mean, in a sense, it is optimal in the following sense that, um, uh, you know, with this one half, basically you get the best rates we know for average case convergence in uh, zero sum games. So this one over T uh, rate of convergence, but uh, it should be robust. Like, uh, like yeah, you, you should be able to modify it and uh, still get last iterate convergence. I don't think like, you know, like one half is like a super tight, half is super tight constant, but uh, certainly with a half you get optimal bounds uh, for certain you know, variants of this problem. But I, I, have, I haven't personally done some super close inspection onto the optimal rate, but like you wouldn't lose this nice behavior if you, you know, went away a little bit from a half, yeah. Thanks. Um, this sort of concludes what I know for the convex concave case, uh, but the major open problem that uh, you know arises and it pertains to the uh, real setting of interest is: can you get any positive result, last iterate or not, when f is not convex concave? And this is what I'm about to discuss in the next segment of my talk. So let's jump into this. And remember the type, now, now we're changing gears. We're going for a local optimal solution, uh, an epsilon delta local minimum on the left or an epsilon delta local min max equilibrium on the right. <clears throat> As you recall, I stated this folklore theorem for the minimization problem. You can, you can get to epsilon delta local minima as long as you're not too greedy about the radius delta Beyond uh, some bound, it becomes a global problem. It becomes NP hard. But if you uh, if you're not too greedy, you can get to epsilon delta local minima. So how, what about on the right? That's an open problem, and um, uh, I want to answer it today with the following result with Stratis and Manolis. So what we show is that first order methods, gradient descent or any other first order method will need a number of queries to F and its gradient that is exponential in the natural parameters of the problem in at least one of them to find an epsilon delta local min max equilibrium in this local regime where the equilibrium is guaranteed to exist. This result is an oracle lower bound. It holds without any further assumptions. It's just, it's just what it is. Okay, it's not subject to complexity theory, but it is a byproduct of a complexity theoretic result that we show, which is that finding an epsilon delta local min max equilibrium in the white box uh, sense, like if you have white box access to F and its gradient, is PPD complete, which in particular means that any algorithm, first order, second order, or whatever, even when it has white box access to F and its gradient, and not oracle access like the previous result, the unconditional result, will have to take super polynomial time to find such epsilon delta local min max equilibria unless the class PPD collapses to P. Unless this happens, no algorithm, even when it has white box access to the function, can compute uh, epsilon delta local min max equilibria 
in polynomial time. Now, I understand that people may not be familiar with the class PPD. It's a sort of like a specialized class, but let me show it in context of other classes you know. It's, it's basically between P and NP, right? And believed to be different than P and NP. As you know, P contains uh, nice problems like linear programming, and P contains a lot of pro problems, including some very hard ones like the traveling salesman problem. And PPD, uh, uh, the nature of the class uh, makes it contain uh, problems uh, from topology, like uh, computing bar fixed points of Lipschitz functions uh, and, and problems from game theory and economics, uh, like finding Nash equilibria or market equilibria. So these problems are contained in PPD and, and in fact are PPD complete, with, which means that this class PPAD, whose definition I'm not going to provide, captures exactly the complexity of these problems from uh, topology and, uh, and uh, uh, game theory and, and economics. So, and that is the kind of like the hallmark of success in complexity theory, if you want, to capture exactly the complexity of a computational problem. So what our result implies is that finding epsilon delta local minimax equilibria of non-convex, non-concave objective functions is exactly as hard as finding Brar fixed points of Lipschitz functions and exactly as hard as finding Nash equilibria of general sum normal form gains. And it's at least as hard as any other problem in this class PPD. Okay. Now, um, you may be wondering like, still, okay, so I showed you some complexity results, some Oracle lower bounds. You may be still wondering, okay, like, okay, now why is min max so much harder than min? Okay. And I could give you the proof but it, of PPD completeness, but it requires some background. Let me try to offer you some tiny bit of evidence about why you should expect min max to be harder than min minimization. And for that sort of like vignette of an idea, I want to do some, I want to do a little comparison. So I want to com compare a two player cooperative game to a two player fully competitive game. So I'm going to consider a game, a min-min game. A min-min game is, you know, a game played by two players who are both want to uh, minimize an objective function f, x, y. One player is controlling x, the other player is controlling y. They have a shared objective function f, x, y. They both want to decrease it. So that's uh, one game I want to consider. I'm going to call that fully cooperative game. And I'm also going to consider a min-max game, like the min-max games that we have been discussing so far. And what I want to show you, I want to show you example best response trajectories in these two games. Okay, so here are my example. Here's my example. So on the min min side, both players are trying to minimize a shared objective function. And if this is then a best response trajectory, so you know, one player is moving along the x-axis, the other player is moving along the y-axis. But the point is that because they share the same objective along the best response dynamics, this shared objective function ought to be decreasing, right? In the, on the min-max side, uh, the objective function should be decreasing when the min player moves and should be increasing when the max player moves, right? So uh, you could see uh, 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 function values along the best response dynamics that like that look like what you see here on the picture, right? And what I want you to compare is how the function values look on the left and how the function values look on the right. And my point is that function values over here reveal where in the best response dynamics you are located. So there's memory in the system, while, while function values in the min-max problem give you no information about where you are. They're all one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. There's, no, there's nothing that decreases, right? And that lack of memory that you can 
achieve in a min-max problem is the, is, the, is the big difference that makes min-maximization a much harder problem than minimization. I don't know, uh, those of you who teach algorithms or those of you who take algorithms, I don't know like, but one of the first examples that I give in a divide and conquer lecture is finding local minima of functions in multiple dimensions. And you can exploit this memory full property of the best response dynamics to actually successfully construct the divide and conquer algorithm that beats exhaustive search for finding local minima functions. Think about it. In 1D, you can find local minima in log n, in log n steps. In, uh, I don't know, in uh, 2D, you can do it in, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you have an n, n by n grid, I think you can do it with order n steps. So you can beat exhaustive search for finding local minima and you can exploit this uh, 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 memory full property of the uh, best response dynamics. But as you see on the right, I get no information, right? And this is what makes min max harder. All right? Now to prove the result, you have to you know, invoke all the mathematical machinery around the class PPD and take a hard problem. Uh, what we do is we start with a variant of the Sperner problem, which is known to be PPD complete and reduce it to the min max problem. So that if you are able to solve the min max problem, you can find the solutions to Sperner. Uh, 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 but uh, I hope that the little picture I showed you earlier kind of like signals a little bit the difference between min min and min max. Uh, justifying why you could expect it to be a harder problem. Uh, okay, so that was my impressionistic proof idea. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I can, I can show you more pictures if we have time in the end, but let me try to wrap things up with a philosophical corollary that I want to draw from the result. Okay, and this is my opinion, debatable, you know, it's just, you know, philosophical corollary. My claim is that in view of this intractability barrier that already arises one step into the multi-agent world, we cannot base multi-agent deep learning in the same paradigm that we used for single agent deep learning, which is to collect lots of data, get access to a supercomputer, route down a complex model and train it with gradient descent. Train the hell out of it using gradient descent. That paradigm was not gonna work in the multi-agent world because of this intractability barrier that gradient descent just is not gonna work. That, that there are important, there are barriers, gradient descent or any other bells and whistles you can add to it is just not gonna work in general. And, and what's important here is the in general, which is the worst case assumption in complexity theory. So that in general, how can general how can you remedy this in general well you have to look more deeply into the application you're trying to solve and i think this is the a point of opportunity for connecting to domain experts uh, about the multi-agent application that you want to solve all right so uh, my view of what the multi-agent deep learning world progress will entail is as follows so we need to talk to domain experts and, and, and understand how to model our multi-agent setting well, not worst case. We have to understand what's going on there. We have to understand how to choose what are the right inductive biases to put into our learning models. We have to understand what are the right solutions we should be after. Should there be some version of local equilibria? Should there be some dynamical behavior? Should there be correlation in the actions of agents? What type of communication should be going to that? And so on and so forth. And we uh, have to, you know, after we decide all this, we have to design the right learning and optimization algorithm to address those issues. And I think that only when we do that, we will get, you know, a lot of successes like the AlphaGo algorithm or the poker algorithm, which incidentally use, use game theoretic understanding to design their methods. They're not blindfolded gradient descent, uh, ascent uh, type of procedures. They use the min-max structure underlying uh, games of uh, complete information in the case of Go. 
and gains of incomplete information in the poker application that I mentioned earlier in my talk. So, uh, you know, trying to kind of like wrap things up and conclude, min-max optimization and equilibrium computation are well-studied topics and they're intimately related to lots of progress that happened in game theory and mathematical programming and online learning theory in the past century. And they also have found profound application in many other fields. Nevertheless, their applications in machine learning pose big challenges due to the dimensionality of the problems we're facing and the non-convexity of the problems we're facing. And we're just not prepared to uh, address those issues. And I do expect these applications to explode either because ML is, turning, is gonna be turning towards multi-agent systems, but also because Oftentimes you get, uh, like in GANs, you get a multi-agent optimization problem because really what you're interested in is a single agent, but you get those other agents that are enforcing constraints on the agent that you care about. But, but still you arrive at a multi-agent uh, formulation. So what I showed today is intractability results for the baby version of this multi-agent problem, where you have two agents that are completely opposing each other. We get PPD completeness results. Uh, so, com you know, complexity barriers, complex theoretic barriers, but also oracle lower bounds, which are independent of any complexity assumptions for finding first order local min-max solutions. And, you know, sort of like, you know, wide uh, open challenges to find uh, gradient based uh, or other first order lightweight methods for equilibrium learning in games, maybe with states. Uh, but even the baby version of that challenge, which is, you know, do something for two players or some games is still wide open. Uh, so in some recent work, we're trying to kind of like tackle the latter baby challenge. Uh, you know, in ongoing work with uh, Noah Golovitz, uh, uh, Stratis and Manolis, we're trying to get asymptotically convergent methods in the non-convex, non-concave case. Of course, you know, Polynomial time convergent methods we're not going to get because of the intractability result, but maybe we can get asymptotically convergent methods. Maybe those methods work reasonably in some applications. Or kind of like riding on my philosophical perspective mentioned earlier, identify multi uh, two agent or multi agent games with structure that enables sidestepping the intractability results. And I have two examples of that in recent work with Dylan Foster and Noah Golovich uh, and with Yelena, Dirko Nicolas, and Mike Jordan. Uh, so, in the first work, we look at the two player zero sum reinforcement learning type of applications where the objective function is non convex, non concave, nevertheless has a lot of structure. And in particular, the minimax theorem holds for that case, despite the fact that the function isn't convex concave. So in that setting with a lot of structure, there's a lot of things you can do. We provide some convergence results for gradient descent ascent. Uh, we, in the other paper with the Elena Jacob Nicholas and Mike Jordan, we uh, look at uh, sort of like uh, more abstract uh, formulations of non-convex, non-concave objectives. Uh, showing that variance of extra gradient converts to uh, equilibria. And this is sort of like what uh, I've been thinking about in this uh, uh, context uh, over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, more questions now. Thank you. Thank, thanks for the talk, Kostis. Uh, yeah, thanks for the very good talk. There's, we have one question currently in the chat, uh, which is uh, by uh, uh, Amin saying, uh, so we still miss the achievability uh, of the sample complexity, I guess, to complement the, the impossibility of the RMS results you, you showed. Right. Yeah. So uh, the, for the intractability results, we only look at the exact case. Uh, of course, the, when you don't know the objective function, life is much harder. So that's why we started from for, for, for sort of like lower bounds for like intractability results, uh, you know, the stronger, the stronger results are when you know the function exactly, but you still have issues. For the upper bounds, uh, you want to get uh, learnability combined with uh, um, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, converging to equilibrium. So for example, in this work here with uh, for two player RL, we get such uh, learnability like this. What we show here is that policy gradient methods uh, give you convergence. But, but, but yeah, it's, very, it's a very important point. When you're looking for upper bounds, you need, you need to consider the learnability as well. Uh, Thanks. I have another question about what you mean by structure. Uh, yeah. So here, like, for example, uh, does that also capture settings where uh, I'm thinking of for, like applications, more like physics application, where we know that, for example, the function, whatever it is, has to satisfy like some spatial like PDE or something like that. Um, do you have any like idea of how we could integrate that in a, in a system to actually, I mean, it's not arbitrary, it has like some very structured uh, behavior, which is not clear how that fits into all the algorithms. Yeah, so, so first of all, I should say that I am not aware, of, I mean, I, and this is my limitation in physics, I'm not aware of a physical system whose uh, behavior is characterized by min-max. Uh, you know, the examples that I know are mostly coming from other places. Uh, but sort of like, uh, you know, like this RL uh, type of application is sort of like, I mean, so RL reinforcement learning is trying to capture, you know, dynamics in the world. And uh, this RL result is an example where sort of like, if, so, you know, in RL, uh, you have a state and, uh, you know, agents take actions and, uh, you know, current state together with the actions taken by players, uh, result in some uh, uh, transition to a new state. Uh, uh, even, even without too many assumptions about the transition, just the mere fact that you have this structure enables, for example, Shapley to show the minimax theorem in that case. So uh, despite the fact that the resulting objective function, if you look at it as a function of the, uh, the policies that the two agents use, it's not on a convex and K function, but nevertheless, just the, the fact that you're looking at, you're working with such a, let's say, Mark, like I guess the salient feature that it's Markovian. So, uh, you know, you can ignore the past, like the transitions to the future are dependent on the current state and the actions taken. Uh, sort of like having that structure there enables you a lot. So, uh, yeah, so my perspective, I guess, is similar to sort of like, uh, yeah. Uh, back to my philosophical corollary, Understanding what problem you solve before you write down a very complex objective function and tar target it with very general tools. You have to understand your setting, like what may go in your favor. And also, what is the right solution concept? Like what should you be shooting for? Maybe you're happy with just chaotic dynamics that have some other good property. I, I don't know, but that's also, that might be a possibility. So I'm not, uh, I'm not here arguing that sort of like, yeah, like you shouldn't necessarily converts to local Nash equilibria. Maybe other things are reasonably good for, for you, but, uh, right? So that, that is my perspective here. Thanks. Uh, so let's see if there's any other question. Otherwise we can take the talk offline and maybe have some questions offline as well. So again, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself or type it in, in the chat. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna take us offline. Um, thanks again for the talk. Thanks, uh, thanks Yeah, thank you. So very 